to another exciting episode of the Andre the Beast Creighton Show. Today is a beautiful story. And let me explain to you where we're going with this so this makes sense. TikTok, TikTok is the new sensation on the social media crave. And every now and then, I run across something that literally captures my attention. And those that know me, it takes a lot to capture my attention. But this particular gentleman, I've been following him and I've been listening to his journey. And let's just call it exactly what it is, a journey. I'm going to let him share a little bit about himself, his journey, some of the things that took him down that journey. Without further ado, let's get into the mind of the one, the only, Mr. Sean Towers. Welcome to the show, big guy. <laughs> Let's get right down to it. Tell the viewers a little bit about Sean Towers before we get into the parts that I'm just anxious to get into. Got you, got you. Well, born and raised in uh, Bronx, New York. I've uh, been in North Carolina now for about uh, 25 years, so I'm officially a North Carolinian, but we'll never forget where I come from. I love my city. And I uh, have seven children, five with my uh Former wife was separated, and uh, uh, she has one before we were married, and I have one before we were married. So seven all together, and um, uh, fifteen year law enforcement career, police officer, fifteen years, and uh, became a Christian back in nineteen ninety seven um, through some uh, uh, like yeah, you mentioned a personal journey. Um, one thing led to another. Uh, became a Christian in ninety seven and deconverted around 2000 and let's say 18. Mm -hmm. And um, here I am today. Before we get, story. before we get in the, into the deconversion, because that's, that's mm -hmm. really what I want to get into a little bit later. Okay. Tell, tell the viewers about your life prior to, to, to even going down that road, because you, 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 there was incidents in your life that you said that naturally you had to become a Christian. And then there was mm -hmm. things beyond that that caused a deconversion. But let me clarify right. something with the viewers. We're not here to demoralize or, or knock your spiritual religions thing. This is his personal journey. So don't judge a book by the cover. But take us down what your life was like prior to that. Yeah. Well, wow. Uh back you want me to go <laughs> the, the good the bad and the ugly <laughs> good the bad and the ugly well i'm an only child you know i'm an only child um my mother raised me for a little while she died before she was 40 years old um heroin and uh, uh prostitution uh, she had a very rough life um so i grew up hard uh, don't have really i don't have really good memories from school um, being that my mother would uh, binge and I would have to uh, wake myself up. And many times I didn't go to school. I would stay home, wait for her to come home. Um, went from, you know, aunt to aunt to grandma to my other grandma, you know. So um, a lot of, of my family had a hand in raising me. Uh, ultimately, I wound up uh, living with my father's mother, my grandmother, um, from about the age of, I would say, 14 until she, well, no, not until she passed away, about 14 to about maybe 22. Mm -hmm. um, I left now, New York City. What was, your, what was your father at, Sean, during this this part of right. your life? You, you would think with your, you know, you having to wake yourself up, your mom's addiction, and you're now trying, you're now becoming a man and don't even know it. What was your father at during this mm -hmm. time? Yeah, so my dad had his own issues. Um, okay. He was actually kind of intertwined into the entertainment business, um, not pursuing a career, but actually working with, uh, you know, artists like uh, Run DMC, Curtis Blow, some of the old school guys back in the day, more so within management. And uh, he was just not around as much. Uh, we did every now and again to get together. I would live with him for, you know, maybe a few months. No really lasted um i don't think it was a connection there like i had with my mother so um i would say now me and my dad is actually closer now than uh we were when i was younger so right okay do 
do um, go down a little bit with now that you're out of that, you and your dad's got a good relationship. How did you manage to come out of that, that, that darkness with what your mm -hmm. mom was going through? And then how yeah. were you able to clearly navigate with, with your dad? Because all this just didn't happen overnight with like a bed of roses. You still got to figure out life. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I wish I had this easy answer. It was a lot of endurance. Um, you know, I've slept on a train uh, or subway, as, as we call it in New York City, um, uh, on the roof, uh, tenement buildings, um, just under bridges, you know, you name it, a lot of people wouldn't believe it. Uh, if uh, those who know me or will see this video, it's probably gonna be the first time I've never heard this. But um, it was just, you know, I survived. Um, I, I wasn't in church or anything like that. So I just lived day to day, you know. Um, and um, my, I guess I wish I had an easy answer. I just persevered. And uh, once I got to the place where I connected with my dad's mother, my grandmother, um, that was when I started to have like some type of you know, a parental guidance, if you will. Um, you know, around that time, junior high, high school, I went to school. You know, um, um, when my mom passed, uh, I hadn't graduated high school yet. I was in the ninth grade when she passed. And uh, that sparked uh, alcoholism. Didn't know it then. Uh, during the big old 40 ounce beers back then, I drank a lot of them every day in uh, trying to mask the pain uh, so my story is similar to many people that uh, I grew up with and around. And what I can say is that uh, I don't have all the answers as to why, but I do know that uh, it was pretty bad around 1997. And that's when I left New York City, which was instrumental in a dramatic change mm -hmm. uh, when I came to North Carolina. When let me go back a little bit and then we'll get into that 1997 okay. journey. Cause I want to take the the people down the part of your life. And, and this is even difficult for me to even comprehend. I, but now I get what you're saying. You can't really talk to your mom because your mom's dealing right. with her own problems. How old were you when you were sleeping in trains and, and, and and L trains is that what they call them in the in, in yeah the yeah yeah I was on a D train a four D train, train too. yeah like what yeah. You scared, take take me into that mind of of a young guy because uh -huh. get real you really don't know the word survival but you don't mm -hmm. you don't have nowhere to really go or nowhere to turn to you don't want to go back into the dysfunction yeah. that's in your house yeah yeah oh yeah and um it was you know strangely enough the individuals who I hung out with as a youngster, they had a similar background. So okay. even though I kind of knew, it was like, well, they are. And it's like that for the people around me. So it's like, you ever heard uh, one say, you know, we grew up poor, but we didn't know we were poor. Right, you know? right, um, right. So I was in that scenario and it seemed like we all were in it. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't like, you know, when is this going to change? And why is it like this? It's just, well, you survive from day to day. And um, I was about, it was between, I say, age 10 to about, when I hooked up with my grandmother, it's about 14. So between the ages of about 10 and 14, so about four years that occurred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it was just, like I said, it, it was basically living from day to day. Um, and it seemed like that was my lot. That was my life. It was the lives, uh, life of the, my friends around me uh, because we bonded together under uh, all of that dysfunction. You know, that's what brought us together. So, um, yeah, I was able to survive in that it did not seem that it was something odd. I guarantee you're probably sitting in, I know you're at work right now. I appreciate you taking time to, to be on the show and share your, your journey with me, but I can see just by looking in your eyes, man, opening up a can of worms and then having to relive it is definitely, I don't, you're probably like, how in the hell did I do this? How did I get out yeah, of yeah, yeah, How did I get yeah, to yeah. where I'm at right now? 1997, mm. 
you're realizing there's there the changes is taking place, but then now 1997 happens. Take me down that part of your life. Mm. And so around that time, um, I had then, let's see, two children. Uh, and the third had been born. And so around that time in my life, I was really, I was affiliated with a lot of violence, um, like gang activity. Um, and I felt that it was best that I totally relocated. Just, mm -hmm. I felt that if I remained where I was in the South Bronx, New York, that I would no doubt go the way of the rest of my peers and family and friends around me. And that was either the grave or prison. Did and you so I, you, you had kids too during that time too, right? Yeah, during that time I had one, uh, two children. Yeah, two daughters and a, a brand new son, just did born. You, did you think, did you think with what you went through growing up, were there questions about being a father? Mm, oh, deep ones, deep ones. Here's something interesting. Um, I said I had a brand new baby boy. I never wanted a boy because I didn't think I would know how to love a boy because mm. I didn't know what that felt like, you know? Mm. Um, and it was women in my life who, uh, though my mom did bring a lot of pain, you know, she also brought a lot of comfort at the same time. And then, you know, my aunts and my grandmas, um, so I didn't want a son. And yes, I had many, many questions. And uh, that all changed when I actually had my first son. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, within myself, I was determined at that point, um, I wanted different. I didn't know how it was going to happen, you know, but I wanted different. So that's when you decided to actually re to relocate the family, just cut, yes. cut the biblical cord from the the choice of either grave prison take me down that road now you're on the road you're on North, heading to chapel hill area <laughs> <laughs> all right so i'm heading to um a small town called greenville north carolina where we started over in a homeless shelter uh for the first time in my life i real you know with my family uh living in a homeless situation um, however, I was very uh, focused and encouraged at that time because I was in a new environment, um, didn't have a lot of those triggers around me and also the negative influences to pull me uh, back into that negativity. So I was able to have a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's where the church came in because that was my first exposure to the church on that level. When I was in a homeless shelter. When you say your exposure, what what actually happened when you first walked? How did your life begin to to change once you walked got into? Yeah. I'm taking the people down, yeah, yeah, down a road that they may not be ready to go down. But now you're into the church because they need to realize right. you came from you came from New York, the Bronx, yep. all that. You know, what I mean, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Now you're in North mm -hmm. you're in the, you're, in, you're in North Carolina, oh, whole shelter. different whole different environment. Whole different environment. Probably the Bible Belt, one of the Bible Belts. Yes, 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 yes. Take us and down so there. I'll, great, I'll, I'll take you there. So one day, laying on my bunk bed in, uh, in the shelter, I heard a woman in the cafeteria, and uh, she was having Bible class. And so I walked in, I sat. Uh, after it was over, I kind of pulled it to the side, you know, I'm kind of uh, tearing up. And I said, you know, I don't know why I'm crying. And, uh, you know, I'm not a crier, you know, I, I would, especially in front of people. And, uh, you know, she had told me that, uh, you know, God was working on my heart. And uh, uh, she had told me that was the first time I heard about forgiveness of sins and things of that nature. And so mm -hmm. uh, after that meeting, I went back to my bunk bed and uh, I had a Bible that she had given me and opened it up. And it was what is called uh, the sinner's prayer that was in the book. And so I prayed that prayer. And I never forget what I said. I just said, uh, you know, God, if you're real. I need you now, you know. And so at that point, what I did was um, I used to smoke and drink and all that stuff. Um, I completely stopped, didn't smoke, didn't drink anymore. Um, my life became uh, leaving that homeless shelter, seeking a job, 
going to church. I was in church five days a week for about 10 years straight. Mm -hmm. um, I did not socialize with anybody uh, that was quote unquote a, a sinner or reminded me of my old life. My entire mm -hmm. life was I was in a bubble with only uh, believers. And so I was really happy. I was uh, I was sober. Uh, um, I was bringing my kids up under my newfound faith. Um, things in my life began to change. Like, you know, I went back and finished school. Um, then I was interested my pastor was a detective, a police detective. And then there were other men in the church who were also law enforcement. That was the first thing that blew my mind. I'm like, I didn't have a good relationship with police in New York City. Right. You know, my rights were violated every day. <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, you know, these guys are like the best people in the world and they are the police. I just, you know, my grandmother always wanted me to go to the police academy in New York. And I used to explain to her grandma that that's not going to happen. You right. know? And so in New York, and, uh, so being in North Carolina, the church were all these officers and a great people um, gave me the clothes off their backs, literally. Right. Um, I, I was uh, I had a job uh, as a security officer. And one day the chief of police saw me and didn't know me and say, hey, you know, you you look like the police. You ever thought about going to the police academy? And I said, oh, here we go again. So I'm taking this <laughs> as signings, right? And I'm yeah. like, no, I, you know, I, I thought about it, but he said, you should go. Uh, long story short, I wound up going in 98. I moved fast. I wound up going to 98. I graduated uh, third in my class. I felt good because I ran with basketball shoes and I outran a bunch of Marines and they had on all the gear and I didn't matter. You know, this kid from the Bronx with some high top of theaters, those were not running shoes. And I got what you call shin splints, man. It was so yeah. painful. But um, I made it, you know, and uh, was uh, in law enforcement for um, on the ground 13 years and then another two administration. But um, yeah, so that, that, that was a dramatic change. You know, I, I went from criminal element to running after criminals, you know, um, mm -hmm. but it made me a good officer because, you know, he couldn't fool me, you know, right. I would, uh, they would, they would wonder how on earth, you know, do you know, you know, uh, what's on my mind and, and what I'm about to do and all of this stuff. Yeah. Cause I've been there. You've been you know? there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but one thing unique about myself, I was just so much for the people that I didn't take pleasure in taking people to jail. It was necessary. But uh, one of the highlights of my entire career was changing a tire in about a hundred degree weather, old guy who couldn't do it himself. Um, another highlight was rescuing a woman from a domestic violence situation where her life was in danger. You know, uh, she was going to die that night. And to know that uh, I brought her to my house, to my family, her, her children, we took her in. I risked my career by doing so, but I just knew that the services that were provided at that point in time wasn't going to protect her. She needed to be out of uh, that neighborhood. And so, you know, it's things like that that brought more joy mm -hmm. than putting the cuffs on individuals. A lot of times when I put the cuffs on these uh, individuals, they reminded me of myself, my old self. Yeah. And it would be, you know, it was like, wow, you know, I know what you're going through. So uh, it was a dramatic change. You know, that's, that's uh, what happened in 1997 going into 98. So when that happened, after that happened, you got into the, when did the religious part of your life begin to, to question? When did you begin to question mm. the religious aspect wow. of your life? Because look, many, many years. yeah, because I, I listen to your TikToks mm -hmm. and I mean, they're, they're deep. And if for the viewers, you need to listen to them because they literally take you into the thought process. When did the thought process change for you to get you to where well, you are now on the TikTok aspect? Yeah. Yeah. So the thought process changed for me the moment I began to tw uh, question a specific doctrine in particular, and that was uh, the tithing doctrine. I was a big giver and a tither from day one. And I remember <clears throat> not having any money. All I had was a tithe in my pocket and I was on my way to church and I went by a homeless guy. And I asked the question to myself uh, or or to what I believe was God at that point. Um, I, I said, you would curse me if I fed this homeless man with the tithe. And it didn't sit right. And so I, I studied for about 
two to three months, I had a, a concordance and a lexicon. I looked up every time the word tithe was mentioned in the Bible and studied it extensively in the original language in its proper context and came to the conclusion that it was a false doctrine that uh, was actually hurting people who were already poor and uh, creating extreme fear in their minds to the degree that if they didn't give that 10%, they thought that they would be cursed right. by God. So that was, uh, it started with doctrine. Um, and that was uh, the first doctrine that I questioned. And uh, it, it didn't turn me away from my faith. It just simply uh, had me sit down and have it out with my pastor and he kicked me and my family out of the church. Uh, what? Wait a minute, what told... happened? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I had, uh, after completing the study and knew I was comfortable uh, saying that I know for a fact that this is uh, a made up doctrine. Um, I sat down with my pastor with all of my notes with my Bible and Krispy Kreme donuts with the with the hot sign that was on. I didn't even get no donuts. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I said, sir, I, I said, if a man is cursed by God, can he make it to heaven? And he said, Absolutely not. I said, I'm glad you said that. I said, I feel we're being hypocritical when we uh call people down to the altar and tell them that all they have to do is confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. Uh, that God rose Jesus from the dead and they'll be saved. I said, we have to tap them on the shoulder and give them that addendum that says, oh, by the way, you have to get 10% of your income or you're going to be cursed. And I said, that is totally contradictory. And the thing that blew my mind was when he said, did I teach you that? And I'm like, excuse me? You know, because I was, I, I was in charge of the sound system. I recorded every sermon. I listened to every sermon multiple times. I didn't watch television. I didn't listen to music. And I was a DJ before. I didn't listen to music, didn't watch TV. All I did was study every day, uh, pray and study every day at work, at home. And so it blew my mind. He asked that question at that moment. I'm like, this can't be happening. And he just asked me, did I teach you that? So I said, yes, sir, you did. Uh, so he basically said, well, find a church that don't tithe and go there. And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing because right. he's totally circumvented it questions that I had. That was my first exposure to, you gotta understand, I, didn't, I told you about my, me and my dad, we didn't really have a relationship. I don't even call him dad to this day. You know, I have a nickname for him. I don't feel comfortable saying that. Um, but my pastor, my former pastor, I think I developed more love for him than my natural father. Right. So when he said that, uh, he didn't realize, uh, you know, the, 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 I was crushed, but I was angry at the same time. Like, how dare you, you know? Uh, so. I started teaching my kids and my, my family at home. And uh, that was before high speed internet. You know, we still had dial up. Yeah. And I, I was teaching my family at home. And then I came across uh, other people, other believers around the world via the internet. And I, I determined that my denomination that I was in was just full of what you call heresy and false biblical teaching. And I became what was called a Calvinist, which is a reformed Christian, uh, holding to the attributes of the first century church where you find in the book of Acts. So I just didn't walk away from my faith. Right, right. Uh, uh, it was a journey. I just walked away from a particular denomination, Pentecostal would be more uh, exact. And um, you know that began the next chapter of my life. Go ahead. I'm 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 intrigued. I've listened to every last one of your things on the TikTok. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. And so at that point, um, I uh, I felt that I found the answers that I look that I was looking for because another issue that I had, and this probably was the most powerful and important. I, I was tired of of what I thought was pretending. Um, mm -hmm. I know what the Bible says: these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, and different things like that. I didn't see that happening. Um, I remember being at a law enforcement funeral twice and attempting to raise from the dead my fellow officers, and it didn't happen. I fasted, I prayed, I didn't have any hidden sin. I knew that I had turned over my life totally to God. And so I began to question um, the ability to do what was in the 66 books as far as the Christian was concerned. And so when I became reformed, that brought the answers, so I felt, because being reformed, we believe that the miracles and, you know, all of that stuff passed away with the prophets of old, and that didn't exist anymore. And so that made sense to me, because I said, yeah, I've never seen blind eyes open, the deaf hear, never did I see the dead raised. And so 
there was one thing that I could not get away from. And my then wife at that time really woke me up to it. I was teaching at home in uh, predestination, which basically means that he is the potter and we are the clay. And he has chosen which vessels to honor and which ones to dishonor. And some vessels were only created for the day of destruction. And my wife looked at me and said, well, what if I'm one of those vessels? Because she always struggled within the church. And when she said that, it, it really hit me hard. And I started to, once again, study a whole lot and determine like, wow, that's not, that's not right. That doesn't seem loving um, to actually uh, create someone and know that uh, basically you're going to, going to send them to this place of eternal torture. It didn't sit well with me. Right. Uh, so I came across uh, someone who I love dearly, uh, Carlton Pearson. Uh, he used to listen to his music. He's, he's a pastor, um, but he was excommunicated because he had came to the conclusion as well that he could not believe that a loving God would actually create a place and send his children there for an eternity to torture them for finite crimes like unbelief. So um, what I did was uh, I went and I took a world religion course that opened up my mind to the fact that others on the face of this earth believe different things just as much as I did, just as much as uh, you may believe or someone else. And it, it, it opened up my mind to the fact that I was very, very narrow minded, kind of like what happened to Malcolm X when he took that trip to Mecca. Right. And uh, he realized, man, that I was wrong in, in many things. And so what, what began to happen was uh, I still was walking away from my faith. It was still doctrine. But then I looked at the concept of faith and, and recognized that many people believe many different things by faith. And a man named Ray Hagen one day I came across on YouTube, he said he would pay the life, my life expenses for the rest of my life, all of my expenses, if I can find one biblical character's gravesite. Now, I felt I knew enough about the Old Testament in particular right. to know that I can find David or, or some of the patriarchs. I know I can find them. And um, I was devastated during that search. So I went on a search to prove him wrong and found that I, not only could I not find any of them, but that, you know, my own faith uh, had borrowed from other religions. Um, sad to say, even pagan uh, things like the flood story didn't begin with the Bible. Disciples being 12 and Christ and things of that nature. Uh, going all the way back to ancient African um, commit uh, beliefs and teachings. It was mind explosive. It was more scary than my son's stage four brain cancer. I'll tell you that. Um, and so my life felt like it was scary. When you say it was yeah. more scarier than your son's brain cancer, that's deep. I mean, very, that's, very that's, much so. that's, that's, that statement in itself yeah. is powerful. But yeah. As you going down this road, are you isolated in your in 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 your search? Like, who do you share this this Ooh, this, oh, this, this all this Lonely. information with? Because it's it's a lot of inf information for you to now process. You've been told this. The one guy that you basically look for as your father basically says, "Adios, amigo. You follow my way, or you don't follow no way." Now what happens? Woo! It was, here's why it was scary. Exactly what you said, it, because of the isolation, I felt isolated because who do I talk to? Right, right. In that very moment, it wasn't that, oh, Sean, you were wrong. It was everybody in your life that you know, everybody. Like I could not think of one person I could talk to. And so that, that lonely stage, um, but I've been through so much, man. It was like, I care so much about what is true that, even if it bruises me and I'm lonely, you know, I'm going to stand by what I believe is true. And so, um, who was the first person? <laughs> oh, wow. I had to think who was the, it, it was my, my then wife and, and come to, you know, I, I, I told her and, uh, she was on board with me because she had so many doubts. And uh, I found out years later that she was not as devout as I was. She was just kind of playing along yes. with it. She was listening to music secular music and stuff behind my back, you know, the kids too, you know, what they tell some me of the things that, what, Sean, what were some of the things that, that your wife shared with you that you didn't even have no idea. She was just riding along in the car with you to be supportive. Yeah. She, she stood by her husband 
Um, and even though she had doubts, you know, she liked parasugo and jeans and Durango boots, and she liked to dress like the modern women, but I wanted her in the long skirts and stuff like that, which she did. But uh, that built resentment over time, which I think is instrumental in our separation, though we are peaceful and we get along great. But um, I can only imagine not being able to be who you are because you simply, uh, you know, she knew how zealous I was. I was the Malcolm X of my faith. Um, uh, you know, I was very stern. And um, she did not feel comfortable saying that she didn't believe that stuff, um, which she, it was right that she did that because I know that I would have probably, you know, it would have been a divorce and stuff like that because I was that uh, dedicated and that narrow-minded and that stern. And so, you know, so I found out later on in life after I had deconverted that, you know, she said, well, you know, uh, it is how it happened. It's so funny. Uh, so we listened to certain songs and one day the song came on and she knew the words. Now with me, when I don't know a specific song as a DJ, I know why I don't know that song is because I didn't listen to music during that time. So I'm like, well, how do you know it? <laughs> so she says, well, I know a whole lot of songs. I'm like, you know, you know, Jay-Z, Blueprint, and everything. Like, what the yeah. world? Like, you know, and, uh, it was a funny conversation. But then, you know, my kids also opened up to me uh, later on. And, and so I found that I, I'm glad that that happened for them, that they, they did not totally shut everything out like I did. Because mm -hmm. um, I had to relearn all over again. I mean, I was like, you know, I watched this movie called Luther. It was about Martin Luther, the Catholic monk. Yeah. And I felt so much, we had so much in common in that we both wanted to see the true power of God. I was tired of the running around, jumping, shouting in the amen, and you're not even know, knowing what you're agreeing to. And I want to see this true power. But yeah, so um, the wife and kids were not as devout as I was, thank goodness, but they hid it from me. Right. So when... Now that you see all this happening into your in, into your life, now you're on social media. What's the message that that you're really trying to spread to them? Because you're yes. not trying to get anybody to do this and do this. I get it. You yep. know, I get yep. what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. But what I'm what's, glad you asked that question. what's your message is for, for for the people yes. who have never saw you or want to yes. yes your your journey. Yes, I'm excited about that question. My message is really, really simple. It is to be encouraged to critically think. I would adjure anyone, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter, any proposition that's uh, proposed, um, to critically think and then ask yourself this question. Uh, consider your, your standard of evidence. You know, what does it take for you to believe a thing? Why should you believe it? And what evidence do you have to support such belief? Just know why you believe what you can believe. Know why you believe what you believe. Critically think about what it is that you believe. Because belief is so important. Because belief turns into actions that can adversely affect me and you. Uh, we have a history of that. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to my people in this country in particular, when you study the, uh, the, the history of our people in this country, we were... Uh, we were forced to assimilate, to abandon all of our spiritual practices, even our language. Right. Uh, I always make this joke. I say my last name is Scott, but do I look Scottish to you? You know, right. um, there's history behind why I speak the language that I speak, why I dress the way I dress. Um, and so I, I challenge people to critically think, especially when it comes to statements of faith. Um, religion, in particular, the Abrahamic religions have proven when one takes that literally, you believe that God promised you land to the degree that you are willing to unalive other people to uh, have what you believe your God wants you to have, i.e. overseas right now, people are dying um, over at the core of the war is a belief that they've been promised a particular piece of real estate. So I say, critically think, and if in fact, for those who are maybe of my form of faith, or of the Abrahamic religion, which I know the best, that's Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, I would say meditate on, especially if you're a parent, that's the good one, that's the good one. Mm -hmm. I'm a parent and I'm a grandparent. I love my kids, I love my grandkids. There's absolutely nothing that they can do that would cause me to take their lives. I, there's just nothing that they can do. 
especially from the aspect of just what they believe or say out of their mouth. So with that being said, I would tell anyone, please, uh, for love's sake, question um, the ethical implications of uh, your, pers- uh, your, your, your chosen God's actions when you read your holy books. Just if we're talking love here, love is obvious. Um, question, don't be scared to question. I grew up in a household where it was, you know, the, the philosophy was do as I say, not as I do. Right. If you ever said why, you'll get slapped across the room. So I didn't just, just deconstruct in my faith. I deconstructed and still am deconstructing in every area of my life. That is not, uh, that is not appropriate parenting, you know? So what I do now with my grandkids, I love it. When they ask me a question, Poppy, why this or Poppy, why that? I say, because, sweetheart, this is why. And I give them reason because when we question is because we need clarification. And we shouldn't be punished for asking clarification. So my message is to critically think about what it is that you believe and why you believe it. And uh, and, and love people, man. Love people regardless of what they believe. Love them. I'm going to ask one more question before we wrap up with two questions. Out of this complete journey that you're going through, and you're not done with the journey. Let me let me throw that out there. I can tell you're not done with this journey. But out of all of it so far, what's the one thing that's so overpowering for you? When a pastor who's been pastoring for 40 years says, Sean, um, thank you because you said something I didn't have enough heart to say. You asked questions that I didn't have enough heart to ask. And because you you were willing to ask those questions and share with us, I'm now deconstructing. That, uh, like I grabbed my uh, <laughs> tissue, is uh, <clears throat> that one. I'm sorry, man. <clears throat> That one is, uh, I think that's the overwhelming one because, let's see, that was my route. I was going to be a pastor. I was already doing the work of a pastor. Right. And so when you really love, um, and you're in this place where fear is so overwhelming, that you won't question things that need to be questioned. Um, and then you finally, you hear it. Yeah. And you say, ah, someone knows how I feel. There is a freedom. I didn't know I was free until I was free. That's and deep. so, yeah, yeah. And that's the overwhelming part. When someone who reminds me of myself was brave enough to ask questions because that's very hard in my particular faith and denomination where I come out of asking certain questions, just that's a violation of your faith. That is doubt. And if any man doubts James 1 and 22 and the Bible says that man should not even think that he'll receive anything from God, that's hard. That's hard. And so that's the overwhelming, uh, that, that gets me every time. Anybody who uh, uh, broke free of the bondage of being scared to the place where they couldn't ask certain questions that were just keeping them up at night. Before we wrap up, how can the viewers follow you on social media or reach out to you? And <laughs> the world, the universe is yours, dog. I already see it. How can they reach out to you? Yeah, uh, you can find me on TikTok. Uh, it's uh, Sean Scott 55. Sean Scott, S H A W N Scott 55. Um, you can put Sean Tower. Just go in the search. You're going to find me. And all of my other social links are there. Um, everything is linked together. So that one location is all they need to find me everywhere else. Do me a favor. I only give this to special individuals. Close out my show to the viewers with something special and positive. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Uh, yes, yes. Here's what's on my heart. Um, people say, Sean, well, what do you believe? And I said, well, I believe those things that I am convinced uh, are true through evidence. And here is my suspicion. Well, do you believe in a higher power? I said, well, I'm very, very careful about the word belief 
because if I do believe, that means I have enough evidence uh, to back up what I believe. And so here's what I'm suspicious of. I'm suspicious of something um, greater than ourselves. Um, and I'm very, very curious about love. So here's what I would say. Um, to genuinely just love people, love people, love people, regardless as to what they believe, they may not believe like you. Um, because in this life, you know, I've seen so much, um, it can be gone in an instant. This is the life that we know we have. Anything beyond this world is speculation uh, connected to faith. And uh, belief itself has that element of doubt because you don't know. Like, I don't believe I have seven children. I know I do. It's a difference. And so with that being said, since we know, right, <laughs> this is the life that we have together collectively. Love one another, man. You know, uh, stand up for people, uh, those who don't feel they have a voice. Um, be kind, you know. Uh, that would be my message. That, 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 I think that, that is the message. I, I have nothing greater to say other than to reevaluate what love means to you. And if it does not include the proper treatment of other people, I say, you know, you need to deconstruct in that area. Love, love is my message. Love people, regardless as to their sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, it doesn't matter. Love people. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another exciting episode of the Andre the Beast Creighton Shot Shot.